Can you hear me? This morning we have uh, the honor of having Dr. Douglas Springer. From the, uh, he's president of the TMA Association, and he's going to talk for about 50 minutes on professionalism. So I'll give a welcome to Dr. Springer. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank uh, ETSU and, and the faculty for inviting me here to talk about this difficult topic. Um, I want to say as a preamble, the things that we're not going to talk about um, are important, and you're going to run into these in your professional life. The things we're not going to talk about this morning are work-life balance, unrealistic expectation by leadership, no matter where, where you are, either in the hospital or at the university, financial pressures that you might have, legal challenges that might occur during your tenure as a uh, practicing physician, issues related to board certification, which are becoming increasingly important, and a, a topic that I think is more important now than ever, ever before, and that's a lack of outside gratification outside the practice of medicine. So those are the things, unfortunately, we don't have time to cover today, but it's, those are topics that I think are going to be important uh, for you to consider, at least in the future. Um, when I was presented this topic on professionalism, first of all, um, I've been in practice for 36 years, and the person that asked me, I said, why are you asking me? I've, I've never even put a thought into it, other than when you practice in a hospital, you see daily uh, lapses in what you would consider professionalism. Uh, and when he presented this to me, I thought, well, what am I going to say for 30 or 40 minutes about professionalism? Because your tendency would be to say, well, just behave. Or when you're doing something and you're questioning it, pretend your mother is in the room. And would you do the same thing if your mother was standing right beside you? Um, but that absorbs 30 seconds, and, and so I, we had to dig into it a little deeper. I will say when I started to review this topic that I didn't realize how much universities have done and training centers have done to make this part of their core curriculum. And uh, the ACGME uh, mandated in 1999 out of the six core competencies that professionalism was one of the six core competencies. It is, by the way, I think the hardest to define. It's they, uh, we have had a terrible time trying to define what it is to be a professional. So the learning objectives today. We want to define some professionalism in terms of behaviors to explain the role of physicians in advancing professionalism. To understand the history of professionalism, I won't go into a long, arduous history, but there's a short one that I think is important in its evolution. Understand what they call the hidden curriculum and define it. And understand what occurs in lapses of, of professionalism and strategies to respond to these lapses. I have a conflict, and that is I am the president of the Tennessee Medical Association. And I do believe as, a, as an organization, as organized medicine, that it, there is some solution here for the ills of medicine because organized medicine involves and encompasses the house of medicine for the state of Tennessee. It involves all specialties, rural, uh, urban practices. So it encompasses everybody. And increasingly, you must know this, that the state of Tennessee has come to the state organizations for help in dealing with the state budget of medicine. So, so medicine and its organized limbs are becoming increasingly important, and it, and it does reflect a bias that I have as far as where the solutions lie. Well, why are we even talking about this? Why are we talking about professionalism? Has professionalism taken a downturn in the last 20 years? And what's influenced this trend if there is a downward trend? All of our traditional standards produce a brotherhood or sisterhood of professionals, and it's been eroded over the last 15 years by insurance companies, government regulations and penalties, business and healthcare systems, 
the legal climate hasn't helped. Allied professionals want to do what doctors have been trained to do, and they are putting themselves up as equals. And then, of course, the internet. You know all of that because as soon as you get a patient in the clinic and start talking to them about things, the first thing they've done is looked up absolutely everything that you're going to talk to them about anyway and then want to discuss it. All of this is combined to influence payments, treatments, standards, and the ability to, our, to, to assert ourselves as a collective, collective group. So our environment has changed also in the last 15 years. The environment um, is that PCPs no longer go to hospitals. Hospitalists have taken over the PCP role. There's been a dramatic breakdown in communication. There's been a reduction in collegial behavior. And there's been a breakdown in information transfer. As an aside, I, I was serving on a committee over at uh, Wellmont and we had some problems with, with communication in the evening, usually. It all happens in the evening. And what it was was the hospitalists wouldn't call the consults to anybody. They wouldn't discuss the case. They wouldn't call them. They'd write them down. And the lowest paid person in the hospital got to call a consult to whoever the consultant was at the other end at 8 or 9 or 10 o'clock at night. So we went to them and said, why didn't you call the consult? Why didn't you dis dis discuss it with the person that was going to see it that evening? If they're going to come out of, out of their home or whatever, why wouldn't you call them? And you know what the answer I got was from the hospitalist? I didn't want to get yelled at. That's the response. And you can see why we're talking about this now, because it's, it's, an, important, it's an important issue. We have... Um, 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 the history, uh, well, the opportunities. So being professional, it is a character trait. Um, it is a skill and a competency that can be practiced, and it must be managed over your entire career. It's no good to get a lecture on professionalism now, and five years from now, let the gradual erosion of time take its toll on your professional behavior. If it isn't managed properly, it can lead to a cynical attitude. It can lead to a loss of empathy, burnout, and what I would describe as ineffective behavior or disruptive behavior. We have a problem area, though, and, and this is going to occur um, for you of all your professional lives, and that is there is a misbalance or asymmetry of power. And that is you have a duty to use your knowledge wisely not to take advantage of other doctors and not to take advantage of, of patients. You have, the, you have the power of knowledge, and that has to be utilized in an appropriate way. Brief history. The original, the original professions were outlined as law, medicine, and divinity. In the Middle Ages, who went into the professions? It all came from the elite. Only the person that could find a patron and only one that could endure long periods of time without pay could ever become a professional. Well, fortunately, now that has all changed. You don't have to come from the elite class to enter into the profession. So the profession has become, appropriately, more widely accessible. In the past and in the Middle Ages, an apprenticeship would lead to a craft in a guild. And a guild was formed in order to, a guild really means it's old English for payment. And dues were paid in to belong to this guild. Dues were paid in order to promote the trade, safeguard the skills and knowledge acquired during the time that they were an apprentice, control the markets because there was a core bunch of people that did that particular trade, aid members that couldn't work or became disabled, helped to control prices, protected financial interests, and then regulated hours. Now, that, does, that sounds like a resident. I mean, that sounds like a doctor. So my thesis to you is that a guild is currently very much like a trade union of today because a trade union of today 
exercised his influence in society, were very powerful, confirmed mastery, by that I mean included the qualified, organized by an occupation, prolonged specialized training was required, collective influence was exercised, and it was self-regulatory in that it excluded the unqualified. So in many respects, I would submit to you that a guild or a trade union is directly equal to a profession in many ways. What I would also submit to you is that being a professional has two distinguishing features. Altruism and ethics. Altruism is oriented towards service, not profit, acts in the public's best interest and society in general, and that is becoming increasingly important, and has a duty to the individual or client or patient. Ethics is the soul of professionalism and encompasses trustworthiness. In 1803, Thomas Percival published a first book on medical ethics, and it was the first time that medicine was actually labeled as a profession. It characterized the practice of medicine as the public trust, and increasingly, and what I said at the beginning of my lecture, the public trust in Tennessee is basically the government exercising some control and payment over a large segment of their budget. And currently in Tennessee right now, one third of the budget is medicine. So it becomes an incredibly important part of the uh, discussion. And Thomas Percival finally recast ethics as a collective rather than an individual physician responsibility in that he felt like the house of medicine was the thing that was providing, providing ethical behavior and professional behavior. You must know though that in the, in the um, 1800s there became a deep distrust of trade unions, deep distrust of professional trades, and because of that, it was the, the public in general felt like uh, professions were acting only in their self-interest. In fact, George Bernard Shaw at the turn of the century framed professionals as conspiracies against the public because they were so constraining. Paul Starr in 1984 wrote out an important book about the social transformation of American medicine and described organized medicine strategic and proactive attempt to reclaim its image and solidify its claims. So the future of the profession of medicine is not guaranteed if challenges are not addressed. Organized medicine will experience a reduction of both power and privilege if things are not stabilized. Buried in this, medicine has to be careful with these areas. Self-interest and self-deception. Whose interest comes first, the physicians or the public in general? And the answer to that is the public in general. And do not let autonomy, which you do have with this power of knowledge, transcend into any type of arrogance. You must know also that articles began to appear about 10 years ago or 15 years ago discussing advertising, the business of medicine, conflicts of interest, and now newer issues in the last five years include duty hours and social media. And rules are being written almost on a monthly basis with regard to the social media phenomenon. So there were calls for definitions of professionalism, curricula for professionalism, and assessment of professionalism, which is why you're all sitting here this morning, because it is part of your core curriculum. And ETSU appropriately has felt that if they were going to do anything about the, they have to respond to the core competencies anyways from the ACGME, but they want to produce people that are professional from the outset, understand professionalism from the outset, so when they send you off to graduate programs or to your careers, that you will have a basis in professionalism. And whether that basis is maintained is going to be up to you. So flashpoints with all of these problems developed. Students started observing conflicted behavior. 
development of cynicism and pushback occurred, and tensions between what was ideal and being taught versus what they saw in practice uh, started to emerge. This is why the development of these major institutional initiatives through the ACA GME developed the six core competencies in 1999, and one of them was certainly professionalism. So now we have a number of organizations that monitor and target certain, certain groups. The AAME targets the undergraduates. The ACGME targets resident education, and the physician charter targets clinical practice. And, and what I'm involved in more than anything else, because I've been out in practice for so long, is basically the physician charter because we don't have, we have to now go back and reteach professionalism to actually practicing physicians. So the AAME and the MSOP, the objectives for the medical students are discussing altruism, knowledge, skill, and dutiful behavior. The ACGME, Residents are expected to show compassion, responsiveness, respect, accountability, and sensitivity. The physician charter, and this was, uh, this was published about three or four years ago, there was three fundamental principles. Um, patient welfare, patient autonomy, and social justice, and then there was 10 commandments right under that. Uh, competence, honesty, patient confidentiality, appropriate relations with patients, improving quality care, improving access to care, just distribution of finite resources, and that's becoming a terribly important thing because there's only one pie and it's getting divided up however you want to divide it up. But there is, no, there is not an infinite amount of money to pay for uh, 400 CT scans on one individual in a year. So that the just distribution of finite resources and who to do what on is, is, is a terribly important topic. Scientific knowledge, maintaining trust and professional responsibilities. Buried in all of this and the difference between what is taught, the formal curriculum, and what is observed, the informal curriculum, is the hidden curriculum. And students and residents uh, are witnessing this on a constant basis. The hidden curriculum is the gap between what is taught, ideally, and what students and residents observe in their training and at the hospital. And examples of conflicts of interest include meeting with pharmaceutical representatives, belonging to speakers bureaus, and work for research organizations, all of which generate income to the individual uh, physician. So the formal curriculum is what you learn in the teaching facilities. The informal curriculum is learning outside the formal setting in a variety of settings. The hidden curriculum are lessons that are learned but are not explicitly intended. And they can be contrary to what you've been taught as ideal. And it involves, and this is, these are things that I hear all the time, playing the game survival, gamesmanship, understanding the prevailing culture. And it can result in a gap between what is taught as ideal and what you're observing is actually occurring in real life. And if there's a small gap, in other words, a lot of the things in the hidden curriculum don't occur, then it makes people reassured. If there's a large gap and you're taught something but you observe something widely and vastly different, it produces anxious residents and anxious, anxious uh, medical students. So the LCME is a compendium of standards that medical students, uh, schools have to operate under. And embedded in this is a new reporting requirement called MS31-A2009. And then it actually addresses the hidden curriculum. And it's titled, and entitled The Learning Environment and states that it's the promotion and development of explicit and appropriate professional attributes in its medical students, 
The standard does not specify that it includes formal learning or informal lessons, and it should be regularly evaluated to, to identify both positive and negative influences, and it is regularly evaluated by, by the medical schools now. Well, what happens when things, things go wrong? The contributors to lapses in behavior, in behavior are the demand for high productivity. And you're going to find this out either uh, during your residency or when you're first starting in practice, if you're employed by somebody, that they're going to expect a certain number of FTEs out of you, I guess. Work-related fatigue and basically struggles outside work. All of this contributes to lapses. So that we shouldn't be surprised that we have lapses in professionalism at any point in our careers. Rather, what we should do is actually anticipate that lapses will occur and then be prepared to deal with them, both personally or at, or on, at the, at the uh, committee level. So these lapses of trans transgression can involve a tier of things. That, and I've, the bottom is, is the base, and it gets worse as you get to the top. So the bottom base, the behavior that disrupts healthcare or the learning environment, and, and includes incivility, disregard for policies, harassment, and intimidation. Just above that, behavior that actually interferes with a patient or public trust in doctors. And this can involve romantic or sexual relationships or conflicts of interest that are so egregious that uh, it, would, it would raise the, the idea that there, has been, there is a quality issue. And I'll give you an example of that. A lot of manu you can see this in the Wall Street Journal. There's a lot of uh, manufacturers of neurologic uh, or spine equipment that have paid these guys boatloads of money to use one of their equipment prostheses. And so they make money the more of these things they put in. And there's a guy written up in the Wall Street Journal about three months ago that put in so much, so much of this stuff, he was so out, outside the curve that they finally investigated him and, and took him out of practice. So, but he became, he, he became solicitous of, of the equipment company that would pay him more to do more. And as you know, that's, that's not the new mantra of medicine anymore. Uh, producing widgets is not, is not quality, and it's not cost, and it's not use of good financial resources. And finally, the upper one is crimes, and this includes, includes murder, pedophilia, and fraud. And, and the guy that was doing the device thing is, is fraud, and he is now in jail. So over the last decade, unprofessional or disruptive behavior, the definition has changed. Fifteen years ago, you were judged on how you actually interacted with patients and with colleagues. Bad behavior was absolutely overt acts of verbal abuse or intimidation, yelling, throwing things. Now the definition is expanded, and it's included uh, uh, from patients to even others in the healthcare environment. And I'm talking about the nurses, uh, the ward secretaries. And so rather than overt acts of yelling and throwing things, less overt acts are now included, and they have to be cognizant of this and a broader view of disruptive behavior has, has, has developed. So there's a spectrum of unprofessional behavior, and part of this is behavior that directly impacts patients, and there's threatening types of behavior and passive-aggressive behavior, and I'll just let you read that. I'll spend the, uh, let you read that over 30 or 40 seconds. These are things that have been identified, and I think it's now pretty apparent that when dealing with unprofessional behavior, they've, they've now at least tried to categorize these broad categories of, of things that affect uh, professional behavior. 
which is also behavior that directly impacts other healthcare professionals. And this is the other less overt type of thing that's, that's developed in the last uh, 10 years. And it indirectly impacts patients and their care. And there's, again, threatening type of behaviors and passive aggressive behaviors. And I'll give you a few seconds to look at that as well. And you can see, you, you know as well as I do, if you see some of this stuff, it kind of brings a smile to your face because you know you've witnessed some of this stuff. There isn't a person in this room that probably, if, there's, if they've been in a residency for a year, that hasn't witnessed at least one of these things in the last year. Now, that's not to say that every one of these things raise, rises to the level of, you know, uh, uh, that you have to intervene, but certainly it's, it certainly has been well categorized. So how common is this? Who notices what? Well, other doctors don't, know, don't obviously pay much attention to or are less sensitive to lapses in professionalism. In fact, when you report lapses, 50% of doctors notice the same type of lapses as 88% of the nurses. So nurses are either, are probably a little more in tune with disruptive behavior. And there are some areas in the hospital that are more concerning and are more susceptible to lapses in professionalism. And that includes operating rooms and surgeons and surgical nurses, uh, emergency departments, obstetrical units, and pediatric units. So if you had some hot spots in the hospital, you can just bet that those are the, those are the hot spots. So the AAME monitors student mistreatment, and it's done as part of a graduation questionnaire. And I didn't know this, but in 2012, 33% of the respondents uh, reported some form of public humiliation, and 15% of the respondents reported sexist remarks. So what's the impact of disruptive behavior? It negatively in in affects the culture of collaboration and respect. And it also produces poor quality care and, and, adverse, and adverse events. It has an effect on nursing. Uh, it causes errors to occur due to a reduction of concentration and ability to think critically. If a nurse gets yelled at or is demeaned, it affects her the rest of her shift. And so that one incident actually can be multiplied over all the patients that she sees over the next eight hours. And it's bad for business because it leads to an increase in RN turnover and an increased amount of dollars being spent on RN training. Interestingly, there's a correlation between reduced communication, patient dissatisfaction, and malpractice suits. Students that have had greater than one complaint about professionalism or 8.5 times more likely in the rest of their career to be subjected to medical board sanctions. And finally, the negative report about behavior of medical students correlated with poor performance in their residency program. So how do we respond to witness lapses? Well, there's four responses. You can either endorse it and you're in rounds and somebody does something and you either provide other anecdotes of the same type of, of um, uh, uh, professional lapse or you start to laugh about it. You can ignore it and pretend not to hear and change the conversation. You can defer action. You'll say, well, I'll report this later, uh, report it to a higher authority, or you can intervene, which we would submit was, is the best approach. Not taking action goes up with the number of people that are standing around when the actual lapse occurs. If there's one person, it's more likely that you're going to take action than if there's 15. And that's the bystander effect. I don't know whether you guys have ever heard about the bystander effect or not, but it goes back to a, a girl that was murdered in 1964, and, and uh, she had no less than 38 people witness her her murderer, 
uh, and calls for help and nobody did anything. It's the, it's the thing called the bystander effect. Someone else, if you're in a group, will always say somebody else will take action. And they, but if no action is taken, it also explains how that bad behavior all of a sudden becomes the new norm. So you start having a dumbing down effect of behavior. And of course, you know, if you're in a residency program or in medical school and you take action, there's always the fear of retaliation. So a strategy for good responses assumes that three things. One, we all aspire to higher standards. Two, we would all want to know if our behavior is not meeting these high standards. And three, we all have the potential to improve. So the stepped approach to dealing with lapses includes this. If it's a minor event or a single event, coaching in the moment can occur. So coaching is, 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 would be the uh, action. If it's a major single event or multiple minor events, then coaching after the moment has to be done. By that I mean taking them aside later when you're not in the big group and making them aware of the serial things that you've observed about their behavior. If it's a recurring event and the counseling has not taken effect, then in the hospital there's consequences to that. And we have committees that deal with that in the hospital. If those consequences are ignored and refractory behavior becomes a problem, despite an improvement plan, then sanctions start to occur. And this is, this is where you don't want to go. Because sanctions occur in accordance with medical staff bylaws and institutional bylaws. And that usually means that you're on your way out. So what now? ETSU and universities in general have, have developed teams uh, and people that are expert in the curriculum of professionalism. And these curriculums emphasize altruism and ethics because those are the two things that distinguish you from a guild or a craft. It makes you a professional. In your residency program and in your medical school, be consistent. And if you do something that is not consistent with professionalism, by that I mean conflict of interest is a good example of that, then explain yourself. If you're, a, if you're, with a, if you're a director and you're directing residents or medical students, and you are on a speaker's bureau, or you're taking money from a drug company to do a research project, explain it. Make it well, well known why you think that is important. Medical schools now and residency programs are evaluating the results, and I, I call this closing the loop. It's okay to say what you need to be doing, but then you need to go back and say, are what you, is it what you're doing making a difference and does it have the re desired results that you want? In other words, is that person uh, evaluating your institution in a positive way? And if it's in a negative way, then you have to take some further corrective action. I don't know how many people in this audience have ever seen a show called The Doctor. Has, any, has anybody ever seen that? It's about a, a, year, a show that was 25 years ago. William Hurt was in it. How, has anybody seen it? Okay, good. Because what this guy was, he was an ENT surgeon that was an absolute arrogant person. He would go making rounds with all of his residents and he would make it very clear to the people that he was seeing that he would rather cut than care about anything. He would go into the OR and play loud music and they would dance around and tell stories and, and generally act foolish. And that was his mantra of work. Until he got throat cancer. And then he went to the head of the ENT department and she treated him like she didn't even know him. She was icy, icy cold. 
and, and uh, he didn't like the treatment. So he went back to a guy that had never danced in the OR, had never made fun of anybody, was a professional but compassionate, and that was the person he chose as a person that would treat his own throat cancer. And that made a transition for this guy. He became a human being. He became a compassionate person, and he re retook this, the oath of professionalism and went back after his throat cancer and became an entirely different type of teacher. And I guess one of the things I think ETSU ought to do is get the movie and make you watch it. It's two hours long, it's phenomenal, and it says everything that we've said this morning in one two-hour movie. So, we're finished, any questions? A difficult area, hard to approach, haven't dealt with some issues, but this is the core of what professionalism, I think, is about right now. Okay, thank you. Oh. Intimidation? Yeah, sure, I can. Uh, um, uh, one of the surgeons did a, uh, a uh, uh, hernia repair, um, inguinal hernia repair, and put some mesh in, had some residents working with him, and, uh, and the resident was responsible for sewing up the wound sent the person back to the floor, and whatever happened in the first 24 hours, either the person coughed or strained or whatever, anyway, the wound broke open. And they were making rounds the next morning, and, and it was apparent that the, uh, there was a dehiscence of the wound and, and probably a further rupture of the wound. And this guy in front of the patient and in front of the resident, who is the one who did the job, said, well, if you'd been sewn up properly by him, this wouldn't have occurred. There's a, there's a perfect example of intimidation, I think. And I think that uh, for something like that, that needs to be dealt with. And, and that person has had other, uh, that person, would have had, has had and will continue to have other issues because they don't know how to act. Any other questions? It's difficult. I mean, there's, there's levels of intimidation, too. I mean, that, does, that goes to the probably the worst egregious example of, of, uh, of uh, intimidation, but it's certainly there are other, there are other things. Okay, thank you very much.